Well, uh, good morning, everybody. It's uh, it's Charlie again. Um, I was asked recently um, in one of the comments to do some video or a video on on software. So what I want to do, um, I want to do this over uh, two videos. Um, the first one, I want to look at the hardware that I typically use, um, and then on the second video, we'll look at the actual hardware code itself. So. Um, I guess, t t as, as an example, I'm going to uh, use this. Um, it's just a simple uh, 16 by 2 LCD screen uh, with an SI 5351 uh, talking to, in this particular case, a, um, a, a an Arduino board there. It's the, uh, the Duo board um, with a simple sort of old bit of um, circuit board there breaking things out. So that's what we use as the basis. Um, very simple um, software code. Uh, what I do, um, we've got the rotary encoder which um, changes the frequency as you can see there. Um, now unfortunately I'm not very enamoured to this uh, blue type screen, it's a little bit hard to see but um, they were pretty cheap and I had a few of them. Um, and what I like to do, um, other people um, have off to one side, for example down here say um, the steps for changing the frequency. In this particular case I'm changing at 1 kilohertz because I've got that little bar there that sits under the 3. So as I, as I rotate the rotary encoder that clocks up. Um, others don't have that little bar there and they have a preference to have written over here say 1 kilohertz. Um, I'm, I'm a very visual person so um, I like to see that so I can just glance and straight away see that if I was to rotate the encoder that would be the digit changing. Uh, and what I do in my code, and we'll look at that, if I push this button down, I've now activated the switch. If I keep it pushed down and rotate, I can now move this to the right, or if I go in the other direction, I go to the left. And if I go all the way around, release, it will actually um, cycle around to here. And if I was to stop here and let go, and start to turn, then that's the digit that starts to increase. So that's the way that I um, prefer to to do my um, my hardware um, for the frequency change um, and like I say others um, uh, prefer to have over here uh, written down what's called the radix in other words how much the frequency is going to change per little click of the rotary encoder um, there's certainly nothing from you changing it just going click 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 and having that cycle through or over here cycle from say um, tens of kilohertz to, to say again tens of hertz, hundreds of hertz to one kilohertz to ten kilohertz or the like. But anyway, suffice to say, this is how I do it and um, that's what I'll be talking about. So, if we just sort of move over here to some assortment of parts we've got. Um, rotary encoders uh, that I, I tend to use um, are pretty stock standard. They're a, uh, a five pin device. This one here has got a few headers soldered on just to allow me to use it in breadboard. But typically you have three on one side, three pins that is, and you have two on the other. Um, sorry about that, not quite focusing there. Um, and the way you wire them up, the, 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 the side with the two pins is the switch. It's a normally open, and if you push that down, as you can just see it, it's just slightly moving, it makes that. So normally open and now it's closed. On the other side the three pins what you typically do is the center pin you have going to earth and the two outer pins are then your rotary encoder output pins that you then feed to your um, microcontroller to detect. Um, so how I wire that up into the circuit is um, that earth there I carry straight through and I also connect to either one of these two pins and then the other pin becomes the output. So the rotary encoder has in the end three signal pins that go back to the Arduino, two for the rotary encoder and then one for the switch. And that switch um, would be then, once it's made, it's sending a low or a zero or an earth back to the, rotary, uh, back to the Arduino. So that's um, what I do there. Now for my code, um, I have that going to uh, interrupt pins, so um, the code we'll look at in the second video um, requires those two signals there coming from the rotary encoder, those two outboard ones there, to go to 
internet, let's say not internet, interrupt enabled pins. Now, um, not all Arduinos um, are the same in terms of the microcontroller. Um, some, all of the digital pins are interrupt enabled. Um, others, that's not necessarily the case. Um, I have found, um, virtually without exception, that uh, if you use pins 2 and 3, um, which I've now sort of standardised on, uh, they are just about always um, interrupt enabled. So here goes a small little version, little um, little micro one, or the mini, the pro mini, and you can see here that pins um, 2 and 3 uh, have been used. The fourth one, pin 2, 3 and 4, the fourth one I normally use for the switch output. So I, I talked about three signals coming out of here, the two rotary and the one switch. I typically utilize pins two and th uh, pins two, three, and four. Um, so suffice to say, whatever device you're using, just to make sure it's going to um, a pin, which is interrupt enabled. And if I was to zoom out here, I've got up on the computer screen um, a, a typical pinout diagram that you have for. Uh, the Arduino, um, you can find these online um, all over the place uh, and you can see here if you were to look at pins 2 and 3, which is these two here, if we were to come out here we can see that they are indeed interrupt enabled it's telling us here that they are right, okay, so that's the rotary encoder um, the next thing we need to look at is the um, SI5351 and um, the screen. So the SI5351, if you were to look quite closely, it uses I2C communications. So just down here, the header pin that uh, drives this. Um, if we start on the right hand side, we've got V in, voltage in, ground, so that's our power. And then we've got SDA and SCL, so data and the clock. Um, that is our, our, our data, let's say again, our, our two-wire I2C communications that are needed to, to talk to this. This particular screen, um, which is the same one here, uh, is also a, um, an I2C device here. So if we were to look just down there on the, the header pins, we can see ground and VCC again and the SDA and the SCL. Um, quite often on these devices here, or I2C devices, there'll either be an SCL or you sometimes see SCK. Um, it's one and the same, it's, it's the clock. So, bringing that back out to the Arduino, um, typically, and certainly on these small devices here, um, it's normally A4 and A5. And what I'm going to do here, and I'll just come back to this, quickly just going back to the same diagram here, you'll see, and again this is where these, these diagrams are useful, over here is the analog pins, and we can see analog 4 and analog 5 come across, and there goes our SDA and our SCL. So SCL is A5, and SDA is pin A4. Um, that's pretty well universal and certainly is for devices like the little Pro Mini here and the like. Um, some of the more modern boards, uh, they've actually broken those out. So some of the older boards would stop up around here, but some of these more modern boards have added another couple of pins on. And if you read the silk screen there, it actually says um, SDA and SEL. So uh, it's another option available to you. Um, I, I typically just always use A4 and A5, and if you look at this board here, um, the header pins uh, over here, we're indeed actually interfacing with, um, on the other side here, analog A4 and A5. Um, and it's a good example here, an older and a, and a more modern board, this one here doesn't have up here SDA and SCL, whereas this one does. So. Um, you just need to sort of work out what board you're using just to make sure that uh, you've, you've identified clearly the, uh, the SDA and the SCL. Um, 
Right, the other thing too we need to be aware of um, for creating um, an SI5351 based um, VFO, variable frequency oscillator and a beat frequency oscillator on the receive or the, the carrier oscillator and the VFO on the transmit side. Um, you have the ability to uh, modify through software the drive level coming out in milliamps. Um, so you need to also just be conscious of what mixer you're using. Um, and if I was, and I apologise for going backwards and forwards, but this is the easiest way of doing it. If I bring up as an example the, the SBL1, um, this is, and same with that uh, the homebrew mixer that I used before, the double balance mixer, that's also a, a level 7 or a 7 dBm um, mixer up here. So you'll see in software we set the SI5351 drive level to be 8 milliamps. Um, that's also the case for the ADE version or the, um, the um, surface mount version. That's also a 7 dBm. But caution if you're using the ADE-1L up here. That's a, uh, a 3 dBm device. Now for that you need to, and we'll see that in the software in the next video, uh, reduce the drive level down to 2 milliamps as opposed to 8. So just a, a word of caution there. Um, I've been using in the past the SBL1 and the Homebrew DBM. Um, I'm looking at purchasing just shortly um, some of these ADE ones, um, I think. Uh, Cost-wise, they're considerably cheaper than the SBL1, and certainly if you buy them in, in lots of 20 or more. So um, that's the uh, the current plan. So I think that's all I need to do just to sort of set the scene um, for the hardware. Um, so we've talked about the rotary encoder and the various pins. We've talked about the need to make sure they're going to. Uh, interrupt enabled pins and that's just a matter of uh, checking um, the, the pinout sheet which is widely available on the internet for the device of uh, what you're using typically two and three is a, uh, a good choice and we've talked about the I2C communications um, between the likes of uh, this LCD screen um, here's another example here that you would have seen in some of the builds that I've been using um, that also uh, if which way is it? Is that way there? If you look closely there, you'll also see um, ground VCC, SCK, and SDA. So again, uh, another I2C um, device for for the, for the, uh, for display. So let's just push that aside there, um, because the other thing we need to just quickly look at to set the scene before we go to the um, the software itself is just setting up the scenario for for where we want to place or how we want to set up the variable frequency oscillator and the beat frequency oscillator. So the next build I'm going to be building is a uh, an 80 meter rig. So I've just notionally got an RF signal down here at uh, 3.7 megs and indicating the, our lower sideband intelligence. I do intend to use a couple of these filters um, this particular filter here is an SSB filter, uh, probably around, uh, if I believe, 2.7 kilohertz is the uh, the bandwidth, and this has a center frequency of 9 megs or 9,000 kilohertz, um, and that's depicted over here. There goes our pass band of the filter with our center frequency of 9 megs. Now, in this particular case, I'm going to use up conversion. So I'm going to have my LO sitting here, and the way I'm going to have, I'm going to have my incoming RF plus my local oscillator is going to transform that that signal there up in frequency, and I'm going to place it about there. So we want to place it just above the pass band of the crystal filter. So therefore the intelligence lies inside the passband. Uh, this is certainly not drawn to scale. Um, bearing in mind this is a 2.7, so to be strictly correct, the passband would be 
or the intelligence would be more like that. So, um, a good rule of thumb for initially setting up um, the beat frequency oscillator is to find the center frequency for the crystal filter here and simply add 1500 Hz um, which will place it up around here that's a it's a good starting point upon which or after which you can then fine tune where that is um, to to get uh, the best reception and then on transmit um, the best um, getting that intelligence or your modulated signal sitting nicely centered inside that uh, the pass bend of your uh, your filter so like i say center frequency plus 1500 hertz um, is a uh, a good starting point so that's probably enough for this particular video that sort of sets the scene um, and later on in software you'll see uh, how we have uh, worked out where that local oscillator needs to sit and because uh, remember that's going to be variable, it has to vary up and down depending on what our tuned or desired uh, receive frequency is in order to continuously place it just sitting um, just off to our, our right hand side or the upper end of our crystal filter and of course the beat frequency oscillator is fixed, that, um, that does not change in frequency, that's a fixed frequency um, so any other thing to say there is in terms of the SI5351 the way I do it um, clock 0 is the variable frequency oscillator and then clock 2 is the beat frequency oscillator or the fixed one um, and there's just to try and get a little bit of isolation there um, I don't bother using clock 1 we just use clock 0 and then the furthest one away from that clock 2 so again in the code you'll see the clock 0 and clock 1 settings um, in the software Rightio, um, enough there. Any questions, just uh, drop them into the, the comments. Um, and like I say, the next video will now build upon this, now that we sort of understand um, where pins need to be and, and the like. And uh, we will lock out the software. So until then, we'll see you shortly.